Adventure is in my blood. Finding treasures big or small and having fun is what it's all about. With my wife, Melissa, and our three kids, life is pretty full. But there isn't a mountain we can't climb together. This isn't your ordinary antique store. My name is Alex Archibald, and this is Curiosity Inc. So I'm often on the channel talking about collectibles and antiques and all kinds of neat stuff. And I'm at my store today right now, which is still uh, overflowing with all sorts of treasures and, and knickknacks. But one thing, one person that you haven't met yet is our employee, Sean. Now he's been with us for, oh, I think about a year or so now, really. <laughs> he's off camera nodding. But I thought it's overdue to introduce you to Sean. So without further ado, let's meet Sean. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> So, Sean, we've known each other, I guess, for probably four or five years, something like that. Yeah, I was thinking about that the other day, probably about five years ago. Were uh, you, okay, well, you're young now, but you must have yeah. been like a fetus when I met you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was uh, uh, 18, I think, when I moved, yeah, I, w I was 18 when I moved to Edmonton. I actually got the job that I met you at there when I was 17 and then got hired officially, like, on my 18th birthday, so I was... At Apple. And you yeah. start, did you start in sales or were you always in the repair side of things? Uh, I started in sales and then moved into doing some repairs and stuff later in. That's right. I, and I was your manager, yeah. which is crazy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we'd have to sit down and figure out what your career path would be. And then you left and went, uh, you're back in school now, right? Yeah. Yeah. I had gone to Toronto there for a little while, lived in Toronto for a bit. And then... What were you uh, doing out there? Uh, you know, I, I, I think I, I wanted to, to be a rock and roll star a little bit and short sighted as, as you, that you laugh, be. you don't think that's a possibility. Uh, I, I, I think, uh, as much as it may be a possibility, it's not necessarily a wise decision to just drop things and move away, but, uh, it was really fun. So, uh, and you were out there for two years. Uh, I was out there actually for about six months or so. And then I was like had enough of this six home. months of toronto yeah well uh i was laughing people there at, uh when i told them i was moving back home to the prairies they were like ah you got torontoed hey <laughs> and now you're back and now i'm back but, but you're from saskatchewan originally right i am yeah i'm from a town called north battleford yeah uh, okay i'm aware of the I, you are forced to drive through the battlefords on the way anywhere else <laughs> yeah down highway 16 so i usually just stop there for gas yeah yeah but, that's i think common <laughs> common and like oh it's about time for some gas yeah, the ad break between uh Edmonton and Saskatoon. <laughs> and you, do you normally just hang out with the guitar? Uh, I assume you play. I, I, I know do. you play. I do. Uh, I know you well enough to know that you play guitar. <laughs> I don't often bring it here, but I do often just hang out with the guitar. And what type of guitar is that? Yeah, this is a Gretsch. Mm. Uh, it's built to model, it, it's a newer guitar, but it's built to model the old uh, parlor guitars from the 30s. Yeah, I see that. It's a smaller, like a jazz style. or it's a Smaller shape, bit more boxy sound. What, like Django Reinhardt would uh, play, that kind of idea? Yeah, I, I, I started getting into these guitars because the guy from Wilco plays them. Ah, okay. Uh, <laughs> which I'm sure anybody who knows me will laugh at that. But uh, yeah, smaller guitars work well for voices that are a little... Uh, Less elegant, I would say. Less elegant? Okay. Yeah. So are you going to play us something today? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I'll, I'll play a tune I, I wrote here. It's, uh, I, I've been writing stuff recently that's kind of, I'm really into the Beach Boys, and they started doing all this stuff where it was like uh, little bits of songs placed next to each other. Okay, is this like when Brian Wilson was hanging out in, in his bed for... Yeah, yeah, just before he went a little crazy. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's pretty much primo Brian Wilson time for me. Oh, <laughs> but... Perfect. Well, uh, yeah, let's see what you do. Here we go. Cool. Yeah, it's a song called Straw People. Straw People. Oh, yeah. Okay. You never talk to no one. Their house is too far away to see. Tell your kids you're no one And they both agree You're born inside a farmhouse A castle surrounded with sea
what's that? Oh, so we... that was some fancy <laughs> guitar playing there, friend. Yeah. I am not as fancy as all that. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, uh, I'm in the process of writing and recording all of these songs right now for uh, both some school stuff that I'm doing and also just kind of for my own personal satisfaction. So do you have a website or a Facebook page? I, I or? do. I actually, I run a, a record label. Oh, so uh, what's the, a record label? You yeah, tell us. the record label is called Great School Records. Grade School Records. Grade School Records. Great yeah. name. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. And where can they check it out? Uh, that would be uh, gradeschoolrecords.ca is the best place to go. Uh, alternatively, the band that I'm in is called Trace Italian, uh, and that's a thing that I write all the music for. So, yeah. Very cool. Well, thanks for sharing that with us. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> okay, so this is going to leave the, uh, the wrong impression that every Canadian knows how to uh, play guitar and sing, which, uh, according to my channel, uh, would make you believe that that's the case. But um, yeah, Sean is very talented, so make sure to check out his work and his website too, and he's busy working away. So if you ever come in the shop, uh, you'll see Sean busy working away here, but also know that he has secret hidden talents. Like Clark Kent, um, he will come out of the phone booth and um, lay down a riff, I guess, instead of um, you know flying up in the air. Uh, so yeah, really cool to uh, introduce you to Sean today. Since I was at the store, a friend of mine, Patrick, came by and he is Mr. Hit and Miss Engine. And if you go to certain fairs around town, you'll see him making ice cream with his Hit and Miss Engine. Uh, so he is a kind enough man that he decided to bring by some oil and gas and we're going to see if we can get this thing to start. And we had to take it off the cart because it would jump all over the place. So it's on the ground now. Pat's just kind of giving it a go. So is that, what does the valve do on the bottom? This is a choke. This is the uh, Oh, cart. it's choke. It's a, called a mixer valve. Okay, so you open it up to start? Or you're covering well, it? Well, you cover it. You getting gas? Getting ready for another auction sale. We have uh, one that's up right now, and occasionally when we look to clear out stock that's been sitting around, we do an auction sale. So in this case, there's gonna be an antique sale. I've gotta take a pile of stuff down to the auction house and uh, get ready for it. I think it's happening at the end of the month. They kinda of just give me a call every once in a while and say, hey, we're thinking about doing an auction, do you wanna put some stuff in? And I usually say yes. <laughs> um, very, before I go and take all that stuff in, I've got a problem. My BMW, um, it's a 2006 uh, 3 Series wagon that I drive, kind of as my daily, you know, get around sort of car. The headlight's been acting up. Now, the place I bought it from put a new headlight in a while ago. Um, apparently it's under warranty that uh, it's not the bulb, it's the ballast, which is ridiculous in my mind. I would sell this car based on that fact alone that you can't just change the headlight. You can, but if the ballast goes, you have to remove the entire front end of the vehicle. It's ridiculous. Anyway, they're gonna take care of it for me. So I'm taking the car into the shop and I've decided to ride my bicycle um, back from the shop because my ambulance is parked over the store. Long story short, we're going on a couple of adventures today. One, I'm gonna take you on a bit of a bike ride tour through Edmonton on my way back to the shop and then we're gonna offload all the stuff at the auction house. Uh, and I'll do a follow-up video to see how this auction sale does and hopefully we'll do okay. So let's head off to the shop, get the car in and then head out on the bike. So I've traded my wheels for my bike. I'm gonna head off back to my store and then do my auction run. So let's go for a little ride. back at the store and this past week I took some time and I went around and I picked out a bunch of stuff that I thought that I didn't need or was extra uh, things that didn't really work in the shop anymore and I've loaded it up it's gonna go off to auction and of course you want to make sure you put a few really good things in the auction sale too so there's some nice swords and some vintage firearms I'll probably put a couple motorcycles in there uh, so we've got the car pretty well loaded up with some of the stuff that's got to go now to head over to the auction house and start processing 
and it will be nice to have wheels again. It's ironic that the old Pontiac here is one of the more reliable vehicles I have. It rarely lets me down. So it's pretty much the same routine every time. You bring your stuff in that you want to sell, you get your little stickers, you stick them on, and then you wait for the auction to happen and hope everything does well. Well, it's been a busy few days of taking stuff to auction. Um, work in the shop today and kind of going through. I had a lady come by and sell me a few things the other day. Now, even though I'm getting rid of stuff, you still have to bring things in. This isn't normally something I would buy. <laughs> this is like a 1970s uh, racquetball kind of <laughs> bag. Now, what's neat about it, uh, and the reason that I bought it, and you're probably wondering, Alex, why did you buy that? Because they're not super collectible. But, you know, it's got a nice little uh, top flight Spalding racket in there. Maybe this will be my new racket buying sports equipment. But the reason I bought this bag was because there were some really cool shoes in it. Now, you might be surprised to know that there are people who buy used footwear. If you're uh, a sneakerhead, like a lot of people are, that won't surprise you at all. There's all sorts of collectors out there. Now, these are, there's two, there's a pair. Uh, these are uh, 1970s Adidas Americana basketball shoes. Now, um, <laughs> they are, they're mesh, they're in really good shape. Uh, they're not really all that worn at all. They're made in France. They're made in France. Um, I don't know why I go to that accent when I think of France. It's like, <laughs> uh, yeah, anyway. The, uh, but they're also my size. These are 11 and a half, so these would actually fit me. Um, so even if I decide not to sell them, I'll have some really cool uh, kicks to wear. These are a high top basketball sneaker, very similar to the type that they wore through the 50s, 60s, and obviously into the 70s with the traditional three stripes on it. Um, a pair of basketball shoes like this can be quite collectible. I'll have to do a little bit of research to see what they're going for in this kind of shape. But you don't want to turn down cool sports memorabilia in gear when you have an opportunity. Actually, uh, with this, there was also, hang on, where is it now? A couple of early baseball gloves <laughs> as I walk out of camera there and to show you. Uh, now, you know they're an early glove when the fingers are separate. Now, Prior to the 1960s, baseball gloves had, they were just gloves. <laughs> they were just kind of lightly padded gloves. So you'd probably feel that, you know, not much padding in there. And certainly probably not all that easy to catch stuff. Um, this one has webbing. So you get a little bit of a, of a, a net there so you can catch the ball. But really, um, very, uh, very early. This is probably from the 50s, I'd say, 50s or early 60s. Not terribly old, but when you look at the old ones from the uh, 20s, um, they don't look too much different than that. So cool old baseball glove. And this, I believe, is a catcher's mitt, Spalding. Uh, and Spalding made in Canada, which is unusual. Not much going on here either. Um, a little bit of loose uh, webbing, I think, that you can connect, but really, that's all you get. It's basically like an oven mitt, a leather oven mitt for your hand, um, and again, not much padding, so this one has gotten uh, really almost petrified in the pocket where the ball's been hitting, uh, but, you know, a nice early piece, and there are guys who collect early sports gear. This one, the leather's actually still nice and soft on it, too, so that is uh, a big bonus, because sometimes these things become fully petrified all throughout, and uh, they're not much good, but... This thing still uh, has a little bit of life left in it. Not that somebody would probably play with it though, but a few cool things. And as I'm going through the bag here, uh, there's some other neat stuff too. And it looks like there is still even a <laughs> new old stock Dunlop squash ball in there. So back in the 70s and 80s, squash was a real big thing. Let's just take this out, see what that is. Ah, I see. It's style and protective eyewear. Check this out. That was one heck of a game today, guys. <laughs> uh, but seriously, we need to get back to the office because I'm going to be expecting those TPS reports to be in stud. A, B, C. Always be closing. A, always B, 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 C. Closing. <laughs> That's me with these glasses on right now. Uh, and then I get into my like 1989 7 Series BMW and peel rubber out of the parking lot. Um, <laughs> anyway, you never know what you're going to find in, uh, <laughs> uh, in a bag of stuff, but I did get some cool shoes and I'm pretty excited about that. And this month I've really had a plan. I've been kind of laying low. 
I've been not buying as much as I normally do, which is kind of difficult for me because I love buying collections and I love getting out to people's houses, but I've taken a break uh, a little bit for the last couple of weeks because we are trying to thin out our product and fine tune, tailor the sorts of things that we carry. Now, as it often goes when you buy collections from people, you sometimes end up with stuff you don't want. Now, normally I had a routine of going to the auction house and, and taking the excess stuff down there, but because I've been so darn busy with all the other stuff and renovating houses and so forth, I haven't had the time to do that. Um, so I'm basically playing catch up this week and just trying to thin out all the extra stuff that I feel I don't really need and try to make the store look and feel fantastic again and provide a great customer experience. And we carry new stuff and I haven't done an order on any of our new products in a really long time. So I've got to do some inventory, see what we're low on and start bringing some more of that cool new product back in. In fact, I don't really talk about too much. Let me show you what we carry. And aside from the antiques, we do carry these sorts of retro toys. Now, sometimes they're wooden pop guns, little tin wind up robots, uh, Jack in the Boxes. This is the same one that they use in the movie Elf, uh, if you remember that, with uh, Will Ferrell. So all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, potato guns, surprisingly a good seller. Uh, everybody seems to like Spud Gun, where you stick it in a potato and you shoot the little potato wedge at people. So all kinds of little odds and ends and neat sorts of things that I haven't been paying much attention to in the shop. So I can see I'm getting low on my Mr. Bills, Gummy and Pokey set. Um, we've got the uh, Switchblade combs, if you remember those. <laughs> I had one of those when I was a kid. My kids actually really think those are cool. Uh, but I can see I haven't gone through, organized my shelves, stuff that's sold out. There's empty boxes sitting here. So I've got to go through and really clean this up. And uh, this week is the week to do it. And this is what usually happens. Right when you think that you've got a bunch of stuff going out the door, more stuff comes in. I've got a little box of estate treasures here. Um, from the looks of things, it looks pretty cool. So let's go through it together and see what there is. And you guys probably know me by now. I love going through little estate boxes of stuff. So without further ado, let's dig through and see what there is. Um, I saw when the fellow brought it in, there was a couple tin toys on the top, and I knew that was probably going to be a good sign right off the bat. Um, okay, so where do I begin? Well, first things first, let's make sure that these are empty. Yes, they are. Well, that one is anyway. Um, this is an old CIL shotgun shell box. And the reason why people might want these, well, uh, if you're decorating, you collect vintage firearms or something, you might want those just as sort of a display piece on the side. Um, we have actually right over here an old CIL display. And you can see the old boxes go inside. They're all empty, but they go inside and it makes it look nice. So that's probably one of the reasons why someone might want one of those. So that's kind of cool. Keep those aside. Now, the thing that caught my eye, these little cards are kind of cool. I think these are the ones you got with like a Jello or Popsicle or something along those lines. Let's see. That's, uh, I think that's an Ed Big Daddy Roth design. Little Coffin. Oh yeah, uh, Monogram Models. Okay, so that's from a Monogram card. And back in, in these days, yeah, look at that. They have a skeleton posing with it. That's so cool. Some of these are, oh yeah, okay. Red sickle ball, sickle, and it's in French and English. So it's probably, you know, mid 1960s, somewhere in there. But little trading cards like that, they can go for, you know, like five bucks a piece to the right person. Things like pictures of jets and planes aren't going to be as exciting unless somebody's filling out the set and there's one that's harder to get than another, but... Those are less interesting. Probably the better ones out of this stack are going to be any that are cars. Oh, there's another one. Paddy Wagon. These old monogram cards. So, eh, kind of a neat little thing. Uh, all right. Well, let's see what else is there. Some little token. Good for one free Lone Star beer. At the Buckhorn Bar. Well, I wonder if they're still around and I can redeem that for my beer. San Antonio, Texas. <laughs> that's a long way to go for a free beer. Maybe that's the whole point. You get your token, you got to go back for your free beer. Okay, let's see. This little guy was in the box. Uh, it looks like he's sort of like a juggling clown. Tin toys are really popular post-war. Um, a lot of this sort of stuff was made to help boost the Japanese economy, of course, after World War II. So most of these you'll find that are Japanese are from the 1950s or early 60s. And then they went over to um, Hong Kong and then to China. So you see that on the newer reproduction ones from the 70s and 80s. This one is Japanese, so it's probably a little bit older. 
So let's see if he does anything. Oh, okay. Kind of works. <laughs> I guess he kind of just tosses that thing back and forth a little bit. Yeah. Minutes of fun. These toys were probably a big disappointment at Christmas time when kids got that and that's like their main gift and that's all it did. But, you know, getting a toy like this is better than getting a sack of coal in your stocking. So, still pretty neat. Let's see what else is in there. Got Mr. Clown, there's another tin toy. This is a kind of a fun one. <laughs> it's an ostrich. I'm gonna set him down over here. So it looks like you wind him up and his little feet probably get going. Let's wind him up and see if he does anything. Okay, let's see what the little guy does. I'm gonna let him go. Release the ostrich. Woo! Got a lack of balance. There he is, his little head kind of bobs. <laughs> Ooh, he's an angry little thing. He's attacking my store. <laughs> this is what I imagine it would feel like to hold an actual tiny ostrich. It's just like kicking and trying to peck at my hand. Okay, well that's an intense little toy. <laughs> mm, so, well, at least it works. A lot of times these little motors get uh, wound too tight or something happens, the spring gets broken. That one still works. That's kind of cool. <laughs> I have too much fun at work. Okay, and there are a few little toys in here, like this guy missing his wheels. But I don't lose hope just yet because sometimes the wheels are sitting at the bottom of a box. So I'm going to put them on my increasingly cluttered counter here. Pocket watch. Uh, this is not solid gold. I can see it's gold filled. Um, it looks like it's got the Eaton's, which was a Canadian department store brand name on it. Uh, 24 hour dial. It could be a decent grade of pocket watch too. We're going to open this up and have a look and see what, uh, what grade this is. And I got the back off of this watch. I can see, there it is, the T Eaton, which stands for Timothy Eaton Company Limited. 15 jewels, which is a decent, you know, a lot of, some people say, oh, it doesn't matter how many jewels a watch has. When it comes to pocket watches, trust me, pocket watch collectors care how many jewels a watch has. 15 or 17 or higher is typically a better quality pocket watch. I said that once in a video, I was referring to watches in general, that the uh, number of jewels matters. That's somewhat true. Um, and jewels, of course, are the little rubies, little pivot points that it has. Um, but watchmakers later on would just put jewels in for no reason and call it like a 32 jewel watch and really it was a junky watch. So you have to be careful, but I would say it does matter when it comes to pocket watches. Um, a one or three jewel watch is just not the same quality. This one is not working. It's got lo lots of nice little engraving um etching in the uh the, the back plate there but the mainspring the balance staff is broken not a difficult repair you have to basically get this but i'm touching normally you'd never touch this on a watch but that part's what's broken because it's broken i touched it normally you would never just kind of put your fingers muddle them in a watch so uh probably like a 1940s watch that thing would probably clean up pretty nice that is ooh, that is old um, yeah, this is, um, I saw that it's three rails, so it's going to be Lionel or Marks. It's O gauge. O is, you know, about twice the size of HO, because H stands for half O. Oh, okay. This is a cool piece. Top wheels. It is a, it is a red line. Um, this is, I think, Twin Mill. Let's see, it should say on the bottom. Yeah, Twin Mill, 1968. It's not the earlier version of the red line wheels, because you can see the axle through it. And uh, funny story about red lines, they actually started off. The whole, one of the main reasons why Hot Wheels came around is that Mattel had over-invested in a uh, plan to make children's pianos. And they ended up with a bunch of extra piano wire and they had to get rid of it. So the uh, axles were made of old piano wire. And uh, they ended up with a bunch of these cars. Now this one is kind of a neat one. It's, um, it's kind of an unusual pink. And pink in the, the world of red lines is generally a harder color to get. This was given away as a promotional uh, item at a gas station. I think it was Shell that gave them away in Canada only. So that's a pretty decent little find for a red line Hot Wheel. Um, if this was just the regular version, I don't know, 20, 30 bucks, uh, because it's the Shell promotional giveaway, this could be $100 um, possibly or more if it was in really good condition. It has some mar marks and scuffs and stuff like that on it, but it is a pretty cool find. Um, being in Canada, you expect to find some of these Canadian only promotions. Well, that's what that is right there. Now, as I'm going through, I'm fine. I am finally finding an oil can. This is neat. It's white rose. This is probably 1940s. It's separator oil. It's meant for a cream separator that you would have out at your farm so you could keep it oiled. Um, so it's probably an earlier piece. Um, condition is not, you know, I say it's not bad. A lot of that surface rust will polish out or come out. The dents, you could pull that out. And yes, yeah, somebody would actually do body work on this thing like they would on a car. Um, pretty collectible though. White Rose is one of the uh, more difficult brands to find up here in Canada. So that's a good piece. 
Um, clearly, I'll get to this. There's obviously all this train track, and I presume, yeah, there's a train down at the bottom there. Uh, Model T instruction book. So if you have a Model T and you want to know how to operate it, which is incredibly difficult with Spark Advance and everything else on a Model T, Model A's are much easier to drive than a T, but there you go. That's your invaluable book there. And it looks like whoever had that upgraded at one point to a 69 GMC truck. Um, owner's manual for that. Put that guy over there. A empty match box. That's not overly exciting. <laughs> um, there is another watch in here. This one's not really that old. It's a Bulova, uh, probably battery operated. I would say certainly battery operated. Bulova is not a bad brand though. So maybe we'll try putting battery in that and I can gift that to one of the kids or something. This is, oh, that looks like it's Calgary Brewing. Let me unroll this. And this is an early Calgary Brewing advertising. Uh, they made ginger ale, they made beer, and they're saying have a barley sandwich. It's big, bold, and beautiful. A barley sandwich. Well, I don't know if that really ever caught on, but it is a cool advertising piece and part of our local Alberta history. People like that graphic with the bison, the buffalo on there. So framed up, that would be a very interesting collectible. So pretty happy with that. Didn't even know what that was. It was just rolled up. Old lighter, an old lock, a little tin friction drive Japanese truck where the, the rear wheels would work on friction. A lot of times they kind of let go too. This looks like a rubber repair kit. Yeah, th this little top part like a cheese grater is meant for scuffing up your rubber surface and you apply the uh, rubber cement in the patch. So that's for patching your tubes. Sold all over the West at McLeod's Crest Rubber Repair Kit. And people who are decorating up a garage, they buy these sorts of things. So I always have a market for that. Some old marbles. Anybody out there lose their marbles? Because I've got them right here. And I'm going to... See, okay, see what this is, a little doll of a football player. He's got a W and he's blue. I'm guessing, if I'm not mistaken, that'll probably be for Winnipeg. And there's all these little pins in the bag too. Let's see, Grey Cup final, good luck. Tie Cats, so Hamil Hamilton Tie Cats, it looks like. Um, we're one of the teams. And I'd be shocked if the blue bombers weren't. Oh, there we go. Yeah, the purple one's bombers. So it must have been the uh, Hamilton Tiger Cats for yellow and the purple for the blue bombers. So that must have been who was playing that year during the finals. During the Grey Cup, so you get that little pin, you get your little doll at the door. And it looks like there's even a extra football in there too. That's a really neat little item, actually. Early football giveaway and made in Japan so you can probably date it to the 1950s and I just kind of poked myself with that needle that's holding them in place cool little guy though and a couple little tokens in here one is from Lloyd Minster Alberta which I've driven through many times on my videos because it borders uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta it's one of our only towns that is on the border so half the town is one area and half the town is the other this is from 1963 souvenir dollar and another little souvenir dollar. People just hang on to all sorts of stuff. You never know what's going to be the good stuff or not. Okay, I can see from the Transformer that's Louis, Louis, Louis Marks and Company. So that's um, early American. Uh, by this point, it was probably made in Japan, though. And we'll see if the engine is in the box. There it is. Now, they actually made... Um, this is the 1666. It's the uh, plastic bodied engine, not the most exciting set. It's the earlier tin stuff that people like. Looks like I got the instructions for it though. Electric train set, yeah, there we go. So this is probably from, you know, the early 60s, probably around the same age as that dollar that was in here. But a couple cute little cars. Classic. This would not have been a very high-end set back in the day, especially not compared to Lionel or some of those other big brands that were out there putting out the big stuff. But it has a set of trestles. It's got all the track, the transformer. It looks to me like it's a complete train set. Um, so yeah, at least we ended up getting a, get a train set out of the deal too. And put that out of the store, probably leave it in the box as is and put a price on it. And for good measure, I thought, why not add an extra thing to the store today? My friend popped in 
and brought me a 1938 Canadian Zephyr Mills jukebox. Uh, needed some restoration, but it's a pretty cool piece and I couldn't say no, so we got it off the back of this truck and it's now in the store. So let's have a quick little look at the new jukebox that came in and uh, see what kind of shape it's in. Now, coin-operated stuff can be pretty pricey to work on because there's a lot of moving parts, which I'll show you in a second. This one is in overall decent condition. I mean, you've got a little bit of uh, varnish coming off. You've got some veneer lifting uh, on the corners, but that's to be expected. Um, this model is from 1938, so it's been around for a while. And you can see that it really wasn't upgraded. Um, it still says two plays for 10 cents, five cents for play. That's probably the original plate that would have been on there. And it didn't stick around in use long enough for people to upgrade it to 25 cents or anything along those lines. So you can tell it's been out of service for some time. Now, the nice thing is it has the original coin mech on it and we're gonna look inside and see how complete it is. The glass is missing, but that's okay. That's just flat glass and I can go to a glass shop and get that cut and put in. It would have said, I think Zephyr or Mills Zephyr, something along those lines on either side, um, scripted sort of hand painted back glass but it does have the, uh, the little reel that tells you what songs would have been in the jukebox and then your selector buttons right here, which you would uh, presumably, I guess, pull it, it looks like. Yeah, you pull it out to reset it and then you push in what you want and then that would play your song. So for the most part, it's pretty well all there. It has the Lucite light up panels on the front and these two red panels light up, they glow and it glows on the inside too. Probably a pretty um, romantic thing, you know, you're sitting there, you're getting ready to see your, your, your best gal and you go on the dance floor and you put your money in the jukebox and put on your favorite song. Now, if we go around to the backside, I've removed the panel. This is what makes them kind of complicated to work on. You can see there's all these different platters and this one takes 78 RPM records. They are a heavy sort of wax. They're very fragile. In fact, I was looking down here earlier and I saw there's remnants of maybe one of the last records that was played in here. Um, Something Suzanne Foxtrot. And yeah, you can see that it's they just shatter when they get broken. So that one must have fallen out when it got moved. And there's still chunks of it lying at the bottom here. So this thing has been out of service for some time. Uh, but the good news is there that uh, nobody's really messed around with it too much on the inside. So it might not be that difficult to get going again. Um, we've got the, the original motors. We've got all the platters in place. Um, that's, this is the needle and the, the arm for it. There's your change box. Ooh, right in there. Your money drops into that little coin box there. And pretty much everything looks like it's here. Now I did see that it's missing the speaker, but from what I can tell at first glance, it looks like the speaker is about the only thing missing. All the other guts and components are here, which means that this is a salvageable jukebox and with some TLC it might actually come back to life again. So for me, it's back to business as usual for now. And that's a good thing because the store has needed my attention. It's needed a little TLC. And it's surprising how much stuff you realize that you have when you start digging through boxes and finding out that uh, you might be still overloaded and stuff. So uh, that's what's been going on this week. It's been a busy, fun adventure. There's auctions going on. Uh, we're doing an antique sale with Kastner at the end of the month. So we're gonna have probably a few hundred items through that sale. And uh, yeah, just refocus and streamline the business. So I just thought I'd give you guys an update on what was going on today the fun, the adventures, and um, yeah, thanks so much for watching and we'll see you all soon. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, as we're gonna be going on some other big adventures very soon that you won't wanna miss. We'll see you guys soon and bye for now.